Odontogenic Mixoma by Heath Kettler, Ian Fulenfa, Nick Hoffmeyer, Reese Gebers, Logan Johnson, and Isaac Homan. Background and Definition Odontogenic myxoma is defined as a rare intraosseous neoplasm. They are typically benign but are often locally aggressive. Odontogenic myxoma is derived from mesenchymal tissue of the forming tooth germ. The neoplasm is painless and as stated does not metastasize. The tumor usually is localized to the jaw and primarily the mandible. Clinical findings. Clinically, there is a wide range of age distribution for this disease, but odontogenic myxomas are usually diagnosed between the ages of 25 to 35. It is more common in females than males. As stated on the previous slides, the area most affected is the mandible of the jaw. There is also a large reoccurrence rate for this neoplasm, being at around 25%. Typically, odontogenic myxomas present as painless or asymptomatic tumors. Larger lesions can present with other conditions, such as hypoesthesia, tooth displacement, and pain. Odontogenic myxomas in and around the maxilla have the ability to invade the maxillary sinus. Radiographic findings. Due to the usually painless and asymptomatic nature of odontogenic myxomas, they are usually first diagnosed through routine dental radiographs. Lesions have been seen and documented in a variety of structures, but a majority of the lesions are found in the mandible. The periphery of the lesion normally presents itself with ill-defined margins, but the lesion can sometimes have a corticated border surrounding it. Scalloping is also often seen between roots of teeth. Internally, the lesion has either a radiolucent or mixed radiolucent slash radioopaque appearance. Smaller lesions tend to be more radiolucent, while larger lesions have a more mixed appearance. Odontogenic myxomas can also present with a multiocular appearance, which is also called honeycomb or soap bubble like in appearance. The multiocular appearance may also be due to trabicular bone trapped in the lesion. Radiographs can also show some of the effects odontogenic myxoma has on surrounding structures. Some of these changes that can be seen on radiographs are invasion of the maxillary sinus, tooth displacement, and root resorption, even though that process is rare. In figure four, one can see with the help of the yellow arrows the diffuse margins of this lesion with a corticated border. It can also be seen that the lesion is located in the mandible and exhibits a multi-ocular appearance, which is common in large lesions. In figure five shows another multi-ocular radiolucency in the mandible. This figure better shows the honeycomb or soap bubble appearance the lesion can sometimes take. It is also seen that the lesion has displaced the third molar distally. Differential interpretation. Differential diagnosis is needed in determining this lesion due to the radiolucent nature of this lesion. This appearance can cause odontogenic myxomas to be confused and misdiagnosed as other lesions. Our dif differential diagnosis of odontogenic myxomas can be based on lesion border, root resorption, tooth displacement, and age of onset. Odontogenic myxoma versus amelioblastoma. In figure 6, we can see a radiograph of an odontogenic myxoma. The lesions show many characteristics of an odontogenic myxoma, including an ill-defined border, and it has caused tooth displacement seen by the third molar, but has not caused root resorption. In figure 7, we can see a radiograph of an amelioblastoma. Age of onset cannot be used to differentiate between these two lesions as both have a wide range of onset with median age of onset for amelioblastoma being around 40 years of age, while for odontogenic myxoma it is between 25 to 35 for most diagnosis. Here the periphery of the lesion is well defined with a corticated border. The internal characteristics of this lesion are radiolucent. 
Many of these lesions exhibit a multi-ocular appearance, again appearing as honeycomb or soap bubble-like. While ameloblastoma causes tooth displacement like odontogenic myxoma, the two defining features of ameloblastoma that differentiate it are that it causes root resorption, which odontogenic myxoma does not, and that ameloblastoma will perforate the cortical bone and cause expansion of the mandible. Odontogenic myxoma versus radicular cyst. Here again in figure 6 we see the same odontogenic myxoma lesion. In figure 8 we see a radiograph of a radicular cyst. Histologically this cyst will be lined with epithelium which does not line odontogenic myxoma lesions, leading us to utilize histological assays to distinguish the two lesions. Radicular cysts form over the apex of tooth roots. Radicular cysts also cause root resorption, again a defining feature distinguishing it from odontogenic myxoma. Odontogenic myxoma versus giant cell granuloma. Again here we have the same radiograph of an odontogenic myxoma lesion. Seen on the right in figure 9 is a giant cell granuloma of the mandible. Giant cell lesions are mostly seen in the anterior mandible, while odontogenic myxoma lesions are seen mostly in the posterior mandible. Both root resorption and tooth displacement are commonly seen in giant cell lesions. The disease has a broad range of onset, making age a non-helpful factor in distinguishing these two lesions. Here, while the lesion is in the posterior of the mandible, other distinguishing features are its well-defined and corticated border and the lack of septations throughout the large lesion. Odontogenic myxoma versus hemangioma. Again here we have the same radiograph of an odontogenic myxoma lesion. Seen on the right in figure 10 is a radiograph of a hemangioma. This is a vascular lesion meaning that a histological look at this lesion can help in distinguishing it from odontogenic myxoma lesions. This lesion also shows inferior displacement of the alveolar nerve, which is not seen in odontogenic myxoma lesions. This lesion may or may not cause tooth displacement due to the inferior nature and location of the lesion. Treatment options. Treatment options for odontogenic myxoma lesions vary greatly depending on the size of the lesion and risk of reoccurrence of the lesion. For small lesions, there are two main treatment options. The first option is enucleation of the lesion followed by curatage of the tumor. What this means is that the entire lesion would be removed without rupturing it. This is why this procedure is indicated for small lesions. Curatage is then done to remove the layer of surrounding bone. This helps to make sure that the entire lesion has been removed and to promote bleeding which in turn will promote growth and healing of the bone. The second option is used to help deal with any residual fragments or sections of necrotic bone. This option is chemical cauterization. This is done to cauterize the surrounding blood vessels and help to build scar tissue around the lesion once it's removed. Different treatment options are utilized for larger lesions, mainly due to their multi-ocular nature. Resection of the lesion is recommended. On top of resection of the lesion, a large amount of surrounding bone is also removed. This is to try and prevent reoccurrence of the lesion. The more conservative the treatment, the higher the prevalence of reoccurrence of the lesion is. Below are our references used in making this presentation. Our image references include the following below. Thank you for watching our presentation.